It is a great honor today as we invite one of the members from the founding team of Twitter and volunteer engineer at Obama for America as our first keynote speaker. Please welcome Mr. Brent Salatel for his sharing about comparing and contrasting, scaling Twitter and the Obama campaign. Please welcome him with a round of applause. It's what uh, 
people feel like when they are in love. Um, and it turns out that it's also what we feel like when we have an idea that we're really excited about, we're really great at. This, this kind of chemical release goes into our brain and we feel very excited. So, what happens when you have an idea like this that is not a normal idea? Because we have lots of ideas throughout the day, right? We're always constantly thinking about things, but we have one particular idea which is very dopamine -y, right? Uh, one idea that is, is bigger than the others. Well, that brings us to kind of the second chemical of our kind of sciencey threesome called norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. How many people know what norepinephrine is? Uh, it's less than the dopamine, the, the dopamine people. So norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter, and the job of norepinephrine, besides being very difficult to say, is that uh, it, it's the thing that connects different synapses in the brain that allows us to actually act on feelings that we have, very specifically dopamine feelings. So in a nutshell, it's what allows us to decide yes or no when we're doing different things. And this is very important when you're doing a startup because um, you have to be able to decide whether you want to work on a million different things and a million different ideas and a million different things uh, you know, that are going on in your daily life. So let me give you an example. I went to college at the University of Kentucky, and I did my bachelor's and master's there. And when I say I did my master's, I, I didn't really do my master's because I dropped out uh, when I was about uh, one month away from getting my certificate. And I always looked at these people growing up and doing my master's. I looked at these people who dropped out so close, and I was like, ah, how could you possibly do this? You worked so hard. You, you sweated, and you, you bled for this. And at the very last second, you leave for something different. And so what that was for me at the time was uh, I started working with a colleague of mine at the university on something called Grease Monkey. How many people know what Grease Monkey is? Oh, that's a lot of people. So Grease Monkey, for those who don't know, is basically a middle layer that was originally a Firefox plugin that allowed you to intercept what was coming down from servers when you visit a page on the internet and modify it before it's actually rendered to your browser. So you can make things, uh, you can control things that weren't meant for you to control. And to me, and to like hackers in general, this is brilliant, right? You can take the stuff that people are trying to give you, and you say, no, I actually want this to do this. And then you can spread that to other people to use. So we wrote a site called userscripts.org, uh, which, which gave us a small bit of internet infamy. It was just a repository for Grease Monkey scripts. And that brought me out to San Francisco. Uh, so what happened was we, uh, my friend moved out to San Francisco through user scripts and Grease Monkey to work at a company. Uh, I ended up coming out later for vacation. Um, but I want to give a brief aside, uh, same way in my talk, about San Francisco. Because you were speaking about San Francisco earlier. And I think it's really important to note that, um, that San Francisco is a very interesting place. There's a lot of smart people in a condensed area. And that's, that's what San Francisco is, really. All the people who gra gra gravitated there, like you said, venture capitalists, et cetera, who provide the money and the backbone for people doing projects. But it's my firm, firm belief that there's not a huge difference between San Francisco, which is like a, a, a modal uh, you know, place for people, smart people and money, and somewhere like Hong Kong, where at a time like this, at this conference, there's a lot of people hanging out together, and all of you are very smart, and there's also people here who can power you know, the financial side of projects that we've been working on. So I think creating these kind of temporal um, you know, um, kind of explosions of smart people is, is very, very valuable. And I mean, don't get me wrong, San Francisco is great for, for that, but um, I mean, anywhere you go, like here, I'm sure there's a lot of type A's here, right? Uh, that's going to be the same as it is in San Francisco. The, the, I think it's even better a little bit because San Franciscans think very highly of themselves. I'm probably a little bit too highly. And I think you have something fantastic here. And I have to believe this 
I have to, because I'm from Kentucky, um, and I have friends back from Kentucky who uh, are working on projects, working on startups, and I want them to succeed, and I love seeing these sorts of things. So it, it, it's really rooted in my soul that uh, this concept is true. Anyway, back to back to dopamine and uh, why I decided to choose Twitter to work on. Now, in 2000 and late 2006, I went on vacation to San Francisco to visit a friend of mine who had moved out there, the fellow I worked on userscripts.org with. And when I was there, I met the people of Odeo, who are, are not who are not Twitter. How many people remember Odeo? Does anybody remember that? Yeah, a couple people over here who came from the US. Odeo was the company, a podcasting company that we did before Twitter. Uh, it was a huge mistake because it turns out that iTunes was pretty good. And um, we eventually spun off into Twitter. Now, it seems obvious at the time for to say, oh, I went and I started working on Twitter. But it, you have to realize that when we started Twitter, when I would tell people about it, the com most common reaction I would get is that is the worst idea I have ever heard in my entire life. I mean, people were like, that's so stupid. I mean, nobody wanted to hear about it at all. And then, but it, to us, we had this kind of fluttery feeling about it, right? We had this kind of dopamine feeling. We're like, well, that's fine if it's your opinion, but uh, fuck you. We like it, and um, we're going to work on this. Uh, so we did. And I think it's important to talk about uh, that when you decide to work on something with somebody, just like dopamine is something that's involved with a uh, first kiss uh, or a project, you probably don't go around kissing every person that you meet. If you do, God bless you, but uh, you probably don't. So, there's a couple questions about when you're working on something like this and you form a relationship with people, and trust me, it really is a relationship when you're working on people on a project like this. Um, you have to figure out, like, how do I decide? How, like, how did I decide to work on Twitter? How did I decide to work on the Obama campaign? Um, I have three rules for, for how I make these decisions up. The first rule is, um, are these the people, or no, sorry, the first rule is, uh, should this exist in the world? Is this something that I want to exist in the world? And if I'm not personally invested in, an ex in it, it existing in the world, then I'm not interested in working on it. Some people, I'm sure, are. Paul, for example, they're like credit card payments. I heard somebody, there was a quote that I don't have in this slide, but I've given it at conferences before that say, you know, who would ever innovate in credit card payments? And like Paul and the Square team obviously proved that people can be very passionate about that and change everything. Uh, that wouldn't be me personally, but. Uh, I was very invested in the idea at the time that was sharing small bits of information with other people, um, often very distant. The second point is, are these the people that can bring this into the world? And I want to emphasize the word can here, because you want to make sure that your team are the collection of people that you think can technically bring this into the world. You, 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 know, you don't want to fire your like, first or second or third person. You often have to push that down the road a little bit, but you, at the very beginning, you want to try to team yourself up with people who are going to be able to execute on this. But more importantly than the people that can execute on it are people that you want to work with. And I can't emphasize this enough. It, you know, you have to work on these sorts of projects with people that you love and with people that you want to work with. And that was very much the case for me in both Twitter and the Obama campaign. I was totally in love with the people um, that I was working with, and that made working on the project, even when it was horrible and depressing, awesome. Um, now, going back to the science briefly, um, there's a problem with dopamine and norepinephrine. Not norepinephrine so much, but dopamine is that it can literally kill you, the chemical, if you have too much of it or enough of it for a sustained period of time. Interestingly, it's also the chemical that gets released by cocaine and uh, a lot of other very dangerous drugs. Um, and so this is a problem, right? You can't be <gasps> like about things all the time or you will die. So Oxytocin. That's, that's my favorite. This is where we get uh, oxytocin. And oxytocin is great because oxytocin is that long lasting love, the, the love that endures. 
right? It's not always exciting, it's not always fluttery feeling, but it's what lasts the test of time. And that is a, it's something that's important in relationships, it's important in science uh, for our bodies to sustain, sustain themselves, and it's important when we're working on projects. Because anybody who's worked on a project here knows that it's not always uh, dopamine fun, right? It's sometimes like really, really, really shitty, right? So you need to be able to sustain yourself through that. I want to talk briefly about starting um, and, and how we start these sorts of things, like how I decided to start Twitter uh, and, and start my work, the Obama campaign. Um, and there's a really fantastic scientist named uh, Peter Gawitzer, and he posited that okay, it starts with an idea, right? That's pretty simple. And he, the, the idea is that like you know I'm going to do this thing. Now he did this study, which I just find totally fascinating, on something called social reality, right? It's like a beautiful phrase, like social reality. So what is that? So basically, he said um, that there was this concept when we were starting the project. So he, got, he did a study, he got a bunch of lawyers together in a room, and he had half of the lawyers say, law students, he had half of them get up in front of the entire class and, and now pronounce very loudly, type A-ish, that, that I'm going to be a lawyer. They would, they would shout it, right? I'm going to be a lawyer. And yet the other half of the students get up and kind of like, quietly write down into the back. Okay? And the results of this are, are amazing, right? This is what's good about science. And so he found that every, almost everybody, about 80% of the people who said, I'm going to be a lawyer, did, they, 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 after that they went and they did a project for about 45 minutes. And almost all the people who pro proclaimed it, regardless of who they were, did about 15 minutes of a 45 minute project less work. Okay? And not, not that they were more efficient, they just did less. And the people who were quietly like, you know, I'm not going to be uh, worked for the entire period of five minutes. They, they felt like they did worse, but they actually did much better. And the whole idea, the, the thing that he posited was that when you declare the fact that, like, you know, very boldly, like, I'm going to be a lawyer, you feel like you've made some step in that direction. You feel like you've taken some initiative and you've done some work, but you haven't done anything, really. You just said you're going to do something. And the people who didn't do that, felt like they had to do much more work, which led them to be more successful. So the way this works is he actually took these students and he put them in, a, in an MRI, right, um, and scanned their brain. And when you say, I'm going to be a lawyer, it stimulates the, the frontal lobe of your brain, right, which is the abstract part of the way you think about things. So it's not real. It's abstract concepts, which are wonderful, but they're not any good unless you execute on them. Or get somebody else to execute on them, I guess. Um, and so he came, what he came up with was this idea that change only happens um, you know, when we don't think about it. Like if we think about it very strongly, then we're not going to do it. But if we kind of dial it back a bit, then that's when change really happens, which I found was great. Um, so the way you can kind of apply this to did they stop is you can say, like if you say, I want to do this project, like how many times do you tell your friends, like, oh, this is a project, I really want to do this, and then you never do it, right? So that's a very, like, you know, frontal lobe sort of thing. Instead, if you say, when I get home, if I get home, then I will hack on this project from 8 to whatever time I have. When I, I'll put, you know, I'll hack on it for one hour when I get home. If you say that out loud to somebody, that actually, in an MRI, stimulates the motor cortex of your brain. The part of your brain that's involved with moving your arms and legs and body around, right? This is scientifically stimulating the part of you that takes action on things. If you say, when I get home, I'm going to do this for an hour. So just our mental mindset on this can make a huge difference in how we actually go about doing our work. Which is what led me to meeting this guy. Uh, he was an old friend of mine, and Harper Reed, he was the CTO for the Obama for America campaign, and um, he's very good at getting people to, oh, he's like, oh, just come out for a weekend and hang out in Chicago, and, you know, I ended up staying there for three months towards the end of the campaign and working on it with him. Um, 
And so that was kind of like the evolutionary step of Twitter was working for the Obama campaign, working for uh, for them doing. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, doing this thing, you know, uh, it was a ragtag group of engineers. First time ever, a uh, political candidate in the U.S. has had their own internal technical team, which has its own host of challenges politically and technically. Uh, very smelly work environment, uh, I'm sure they're not used to. Um, so, more on that in a bit. Uh, so, what was the difference between Twitter and the Obama campaign? A lot of time passed between the two things Twitter in 2007, the Obama campaign, and I want to go over a couple of things that have changed and a couple things that haven't changed. So, this obviously changed the size of the company. This is a photo taken in 2007. Uh, this is the small, very small at the time Twitter office. Um, that's me, right there. Uh, you've got you know, Jason, uh, Miz, and uh, there's Jack back there hiding in the corner. Now, the funny thing is I found this photo not because I want to show the size of the company. There's something much more fascinating on a technical level about this photo, and that's what's right here off the screen that you can't see. What's out of the camera shot here, because they didn't care about taking a photo of it, is a Lenovo ThinkPad that controls all of Canada at the time, technically. And so everyone's supposed to do a trip over the Ethernet cable and jerk the laptop off of the table and all of Canada would go down. <laughs> and that was the moment. Shit, we got like Canada back in. And what was funny is when I was searching for this photo, I was trying to find it because I knew I had like labeled it like Canada, you know, ThinkPad. I, the only thing I found was ha, Lenovo's Twitter page uh, from Canada, which I was like, oh, that's nice. I'm sure they appreciate the fact that they have more resources now to serve this page than a small ThinkPad and a tiny office. Uh, one thing, so, so one thing that has changed and hasn't changed is the ability to move quickly. When you look at Twitter, when you look at the Obama campaign, the thing that's drawn me to both of them was both had an inherent a desire and ability to move quickly. Now that is a baseline, I think, for any project that you work on. Um, you want to be working on something where people are going to move quickly. What has changed is our ability, our ability technically to move quickly and how we do that. This is just kind of an anecdote uh, where before I worked on Twitter, many, many years ago, I worked for GE, uh, a company that was not able to move quickly. And we were often fighting with third party vendors and just working constantly to integrate with these large systems. Then when I got to work for Twitter, we got to you know, develop quickly. We were one of the first uh, you know, major Rails applications, and we started building a platform that could integrate with third-party developers and third-party APIs. And then the Obama campaign was kind of the epitome of this, in which we got to truly build out an internal platform where, like, I don't know how much you know about politics, especially in the US, but there's a lot of third-party vendors that all have traditionally always served the needs of, for example, a campaign. And these third party vendors are complicated political beasts in themselves and don't always service the needs of the campaign and especially the technical staff of the campaign. So one of the primary like, theories behind the Obama for America campaign that I think is very applicable to other situations is how can you make kind of a platform where you can take in all the stuff that you kind of have to take in for maybe political reasons and then do your own stuff, and then like mix and blend them. So it's kind of like the next evolutionary process uh, in the sort of work that I've been doing. Now sometimes you can move too quickly. This, for those who don't know, is, you know, you know who this is? Exactly, from Thundercats. This was the deploy photo that we would paste in Campfire, which is a chat system, anytime we were deploying in the early days, and somebody would literally scream out, I'm deploying, and paste this into Campfire. Sometimes they wouldn't scream it out, and in the very early days of Twitter, 
if somebody else happened to want to be deploying at the same time, and they weren't actively monitoring chat and seeing this photo for the like, hundredth time, then there would be a conflict, right? Uh, and things would explode. Um, so, you know, of course, it took us a while to get these sorts of processes down, which is why I would say to, um, oh, well, first, firstly, we, we deployed a lot, by the way, and Twitter and Obama, and I can't overemphasize deploying quickly, deploying a lot, like the, the grab, I think it's so important. It's a roll forward with changes. Sometimes you have to roll back, but engineers love to deploy a lot, right? It's fun. Your stuff is getting pushed out there, whether it's a fix that you've done for something that was broken, or whether it's something completely new. The second thing I would recommend very strongly is to hire a deploy master as soon as you grow <coughs> to the point where you feel like it's necessary. And you can tell it's necessary because engineers will start getting more and more stressed out with each other about the deploy process. And at this point, it's, it's a huge relief to hire somebody that is kind of a mediator of deploying software. These people are brilliant, brilliant geniuses who don't get near enough credit for the engineering prowess that comes into play when working with a large scale system and how it all gets pushed out to people in real time. <coughs> Employee, you can hire this guy if you can find him. It was about seven or eight years ago that this photo was taken. So he's going to be, imagine a much older Thundercat guy in Speedos. And obviously, you can find him, you know, hire him. Um, and then I would also very highly recommend building out an internal tools team. Um, this isn't necessary early on, but as soon as possible, you want somebody to be working full time on the tools that you're using at your office, right? People put this to the wayside, and some of the best things at Twitter came out of the internal tools team. Bootstrap, which many of you probably use, was an internal tools project. Now, I don't know about what it's like now, but when I left uh, three years ago, two and a half years ago, the Twitter.com was not based on Bootstrap at all, right? And everybody thinks it was, but it, it wasn't. Now, I can't speak for the company now, but Bootstrap was purely for internal tools. The style was the same, but that whole project came out of uh, the internal tools team. So this is new. Um, I'm actually very sad. This is a very sensitive subject to me because I'm sad because I missed this whole thing. It's infrastructure as a service, right? When we started Twitter, this didn't exist, really, in the way that it exists today. And so we had to build everything out ourselves. And we were heads down, and we, we integrated infrastructure as a service as we went along. Now, I didn't work on a lot of that part of things, so I missed this whole thing. You know, uh, I had played with AWS before a little bit. I think that was out before Twitter. Uh, and I think, yes, S3 was out at least. And um, now this is everything, right? Like every single thing is, is, infrastructure, is, is built on something that provides an infrastructure piece of service. Because who really wants to be doing that themselves? There's a, an example is, is this. Um, there, so this is Justin Bieber's first tweet, Whew, and I can tell you that that was a bad day uh, for us. I mean, a great day, but a bad day uh, for us when, when Bieber first tweeted, first tweeted on Twitter. Um, okay, interesting side note, I remember we, say, we said we would never use the word tweet ever because we thought it sounded too ridiculous, and you know, now we use it. Uh, but so this is Bieber's first, first tweet. And this is how I felt on that day. <laughs> Which was not, this isn't me singing like Bieber. <laughs> this, is, uh, this, is, this is actually an ASCII photo of me at the Obama campaign. Um, and and when, when Bieber tweets, we, you, you often would see something like this. Um, which is my favorite error page that we ever had at Twitter, ever. Uh, you know, an ice cream cone saying, hurry up, it's cool, I can chill. Uh, and the thing that was really interesting about this from a social perspective is when this error, I knew how much I loved Twitter, when this error page would come up, and the first thing that went through my mind was, fuck, I can't tweet about how cute this is. Because I would see it and I would be like, ah, this is great, I want to share the, this beautiful photo with everybody, but I couldn't do it. And that was always amazing to me how that surprised me every time. Um, which also uh, brings me to a point that I think everybody knows, it's probably worth saying you know, is that we had a lot of fun at Twitter, at the Obama campaign, 
And the Obama campaign was almost controversial in a way because the technical team was having so much more fun than everybody else. I mean, I, I, maybe not more fun, but a different kind of fun in a nerdy engineering way. You know, we had laser pointers and fog machines and whatnot. Um, and so that's always important, obviously, to be having fun and keep that as kind of a core rhetoric that you have. Um, anyway, back to the presentation. Then this happened, which is Bieber's first Instagram. And this was in 2011, I believe. So years later. And the, the reason I'm telling this, the funny thing about this was, I was at this party one night um, with Mike, one of the founders of Instagram, and this had just happened earlier in the week, and it was his birthday. So he was having a birthday party, and I thought, man, this guy must be in a horrible place. He's enjoying his birthday, but it, Bieber just, you know, posted his first thing. And so inside, when I was talking to him, I felt like this uh, a little bit. And that's actually more how it looks on the outside. Inside, I felt more like this. <laughs> and I was so excited to rub it in his face. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. That little fucker, like, like Bieber just posted on Instagram. And he's screwed. He's so tired and exhausted. And so I finally brought up the conversation. We were just standing there hanging out. And I was like, so, you know, Bieber joined her this week. How's it going for you? <laughs> And he, his response was this, no big deal. And I was like, what? Like, no, no you're, you're raining on my grave here. Well, it turns out that, of course, uh, they were at AWS. And uh, not that AWS or these sorts of scalable cloud infrastructures are a solution to all your problems. But in this particular case, which I think is a cool story, um, they had proactively noticed that Beaver had posted a photo to Instagram and called them and said, hey, don't worry about it. We've allocated some more service to you, so it's no big deal. So that sucked uh, for me, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, now, you even have things like this, like Fauna, um, which is uh, came out of a, a gentleman named Evan Weaver, who was a brilliant engineer at Twitter. And this is actually a timeline as a service. Right? So the thing about timelines is they're very difficult to make. Timeline being a, a series of bits of information that you need to have time ordered, you know, and spread those out to a lot of different people. That's very technically challenging, it turns out. Because it's fine if you have like, you know, a small group of people, but as soon as you have a large number of people with interdependent relationships, the way that you actually do this can get very hard, which is which we found out during Twitter. Um, and so now you can even, you can sign up for something like Fauna, and, and you can just boop, and you have a scalable timeline service for whatever project you're working on, which is so fascinating to me that we now have these tools that take away some of the grunt work that we had to do for many of the ideas that we brought about. Uh, we don't have tools, and actually it's interesting because you were talking about hardware. Um, we don't have enough tools. We're getting better with things like 3D printing and different maker rooms and whatnot, but Tools in order to bring about hardware change, I think, are a really interesting place where we can innovate as a service because making physical things is hard, right, still. Uh, it's getting easier, but it's still very hard, much harder than making software now. Uh, at, least, at least a lot of the services aren't available to make hardware like that. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, social growth, very different between Twitter and Obama. Um, we had this thing at Twitter that we called the black hole problem. And the idea was, if you signed up for Twitter, who, uh, it was so bad that you would normally land at your home timeline with zero followers, not following anybody, and then our instruction to you, the first thing we'd say, number one, make a tweet. I, just, I was told you to think about this for a second. You have no followers. You're not following anybody, and we want you to say something to people. It, it, it was the worst, it made me want to vomit. It, made, it was the worst possible experience for people, and we had that forever. And the best thing we could do, the best our genius minds could come up with, was to create something like this, which is a suggested users page, which I spoke about earlier. Here's my face on it, which definitely doesn't want to be there. And we're like, oh, we want to create a list of the people that everybody should follow. Eventually, we made it country specific. Now it's much smarter. We also had, uh, you know, we could like import Yahoo and Hotmail. 
<laughs> that helps. When you have no users and nobody else of your friends are using the service. Obama, on the other hand, has a uh, crazily, crazily different problem. They have a too much data problem. But how cool is that, right? Now you get to solve, like, you get to be given a problem as an engineer, and you get to say, oh, I got too much data. We love those sorts of problems, right? So all your, you, know, you have a fucking billion friends on Facebook. How do we use that to empower more people to know about the Obama campaign and people who want to vote? So um, one of the big innovations in the Obama campaign was looking at this gigantic set of data and saying, how can we, like, micro talk to people, how can we do like micro-targeting, and I think um, it was uh, somebody, somebody, somebody who coined the term micro-listening, Tim O'Reilly, I think, was talking to Harper and coined the term micro-listening, and it's, it's the idea of how do we like really get people to listen to what we're saying on a very accurate level. So the idea was how do we get, um, out of all your followers, we don't want to send a message, we don't want you to send a, a Facebook message to you know, a, like a hardcore Republican, right, because that's worthless. They're not going to vote, no matter how much you talk to them. They're not going to vote for a law or a Democrat, no matter how much you talk to them. So how do we find out who you can have the most influence over, and then who is going to be the most effective person for you to send something to? So that was huge. This is, oh, and this is a picture of our, our importer, our friends, when you got into Twitter back in the day, um, which is totally worthless. Uh, this was kind of cool. Uh, I, so we would actually send direct messages from the president <coughs> to people, right? And now you couldn't do something like this in the past. And people love it. And of course they know it's not really the president sitting down with the hands and going, how's your, how's your breakfast today? And they know it's really actually this guy, which is true. That's <laughs> <laughs> Mark Trammell sitting in the back of the, the campaign headquarters tweeting at people from the president. Um, but still, you get that, that tingly sensation when somebody reaches out to you on a personal level. And so the more you can do that sort of thing, uh, the better. And that kind of brings me to how I'll, I, I'd like to wrap this up, which is uh, a quote, which is one of my favorite quotes from an author named Stephen Pressfield. He wrote a book called Do the Work, which is a book kind of all on getting out there and actually doing the things that you care about. Fantastic read. And he said that a child has no trouble believing the unbelievable, nor does the genius or the madman. It's only you and I, with our big brains and tiny hearts, who doubt, overthink, and hesitate. I, I love this quote. And so my challenge to everybody here would be to, for a moment, whether it's the rest of the day, today, while you're talking to other people, other peers, other very smart people who are here, whether it's the rest of the week, or however, for however long you can, suspend some of like the head hesitation and doubt that ends up getting like kind of like you know, taking over what we should be really working on and focusing on, and kind of like you know dare to kind of like take on what this blocks. So that's it, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Britt, for an insightful presentation.